When I think of all you made, the sun, the moon, and the stars, no praise is high enough to express how great you are. What a mighty God we
angels, they bow before the mighty God we serve. Oh, mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, my, my, mighty God we serve. Angels bow, angels, they bow. Good morning, Allen Temple. Let us stand and welcome the Holy Spirit into this place.
worship and praise our God. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. As you remain standing, those of you who are able, for our doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings to worship can be found in your bulletin and also on the screen as we read responsively. My Lord, what a morning. You have raised up a mighty nation and a mighty people. And we are strong, proud, and glorious. My Lord, what a morning. You have brought us through the dips and hollows, through the ups and downs, over hills and mountains, and through the valleys. And we are strong, proud, brave, and yours. My Lord, what a morning. You have called each of us for such a time as this. Together, my, oh my Lord, Lord, this morning, we, we have come, come to celebrate you, you, to affirm ourselves as images of you in all your glory, and to say, yes, Lord, we are strong, we are proud, we are brave, and we are yours in every way. Amen. As you remain standing for our hymn of praise this morning, lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. As we sing with lifted voices the Negro National Anthem, let's sing this song to the glory of our power so we can praise God for bringing us from a mighty, mighty long way. Lift every voice and sing. Thank you. 
Come to the place for which our Father sighed. We have come. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. you to pray with me this morning for our invocation. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Heavenly Father, we come this morning here at Allen Temple, here over the internet, Lord, just to give you the praises that you so richly deserve. Father, we thank you for this opportunity where you gave us life, health, breath, and strength just to praise your name one more time. For God, you are worthy to be praised. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God, we couldn't do anything without you. God, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. You watched over us, Lord. You kept us during this week. And Father, we came here this morning just to celebrate your holy name, yes. just to praise your holy name. God, we came here this morning to celebrate because you are worthy to be praised. God, you didn't have to do it. 
but you did it anyway. Because you love us so much, because you showed us grace and mercy, we just thank you this morning for this opportunity. Lord, we love thee. We adore thee. We magnify your precious name, God. We give you all the honor and glory because you so richly deserve it, Lord. Where, where would we be without you, Lord? We would be lost with no direction, with no guidance. But God, we just thank you that you stood by your word and you said that you would never leave us nor forsake us, Heavenly Father. For God, you are not a man that shall lie, neither should the Son of Man repent. And we just give you the praise of this morning, Heavenly Father, for just one more time. God, we could have been in the hospital bed. We could have been in the nursing home. We could have been in the lonely grave. But thank God you saw fit this morning that we were here to serve you, Heavenly Father. Well, God, we give it all to you this morning. Bless us. Bless us as we praise your name this morning. Bless the ushers. Bless the video team. Bless the praise team, the musicians. And Heavenly Father, bless these ministers to do what thus says the Lord. But Lord, more importantly, bless the preacher of the hour, Heavenly Father. Touch him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Let the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart be acceptable in your sight. For God, he is the vessel. He is the vessel this morning that you will use him to deliver a word for your people. For it is your word, not as his word, Heavenly Father. It is your word that he will deliver. God, we just thank you for all that you have done, all that you will do. We invoke your Holy Spirit right now, Heavenly Father. Invoke your Holy Spirit now in the people so they can praise you as they want to praise you, Heavenly Father. Oh, God, you are so worthy, so worthy to be praised, Lord. We just thank you. Thank you for walking with us on this journey. Thank you, God, for talking with us on this journey. Thank you, God, each and every day, for each and every hour, Lord. We praise you, Father. We give it all to you, Lord. Where would we be? Where would we be if it wasn't for you, God? You are such a faithful God. You are obedient, God, and you always stand on your word. And we just give you all the honor and praise and glory. But last but not least, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross so that we may have salvation. We may have life and have life and live it more abundantly, Heavenly Father. Oh, thank you for Jesus, for taking the steps to the cross to save a dying soul like us who aren't worthy. We aren't worthy, Lord, but we are just filthy rags. But God, we just thank you anyway. Thank you for being the God all by yourself, all by yourself. There is none other like you. There is none other like you. You are the only true and holy God. And we will forever praise your holy name. And we will ever be so careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name we say amen, amen, and amen. There is none like you, Lord. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I can search the Lord, the eternity, Lord. There is no Our scripture lesson this morning will be taken from Acts, 22nd chapter, 22nd through the 29th verses. And it's from the NIV. Acts, 22nd chapter, 
22nd through the 29th verses. And it reads as such. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the satyrian standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported, What are you going to do? he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I have to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Thus I have read Acts, 22nd chapter, 22 through 29th verses. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 I ask those of you to stand who are able for our intro to the Decalogue. Decalogue. Hear what Christ our Savior says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. You shall love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And a new commandment I give to you, that you should love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. If you do this, then all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, the glory of Patra. presence of our Lord. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is now time to receive the first of our two offerings this morning. This is the offering of missions. And here at Allen Temple, our vision is that we are conforming to Christ to transform the world. And the mission of this church is that we are a city on a hill deeply rooted in our faith, attending to the spiritual, the social, the physical and the psychological needs of others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And because we are conforming to Christ to transform the world, we are taking upon Christ-like characteristics so that we can go out and not act like ourselves, but act like Christ and the way he acted. 
And in, in the Bible, it clearly says that when people were thirsty, he gave them something to drink. When they were hungry, he fed them. Yeah. When they were in prison, he visited them. When they were sick, he spent time with them. So this is the way we take upon the nature of Christ. And here in our offering of missions, we want to be able to not only go out there and exhibit those characteristics, but also give people an opportunity to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this morning, the ask is very simple. We want to be able to do this as collectively, as a community of Christ, to go out and impact the world of those that are in need, that are less fortunate than we are. So this morning, we're simply asking you on this effort to give at least $10, the minimum of $10, so that we might continue to be Jesus' hands, his feet, but more importantly, his heart to a world that needs to know about Jesus the Christ. Amen? Amen. So there are five different ways you can give at Allen Temple this morning. You can give via Givelify. You can give through PayPal. You can give through credit card. Or you can simply, or Cash App, or simply, you can, if you're watching online, you can mail your check to Allen Temple, 322 Franklin Avenue, Mount Vernon, New York, 10553. And for those here in the sanctuary, we have even something better. If you have your bulletin, you can pick it up and just scan, take a picture of the QR code right there, and it'll take you quickly to a given site. Won't you help us to continue what Christ has asked us to do, to be his hands, his feet? So while the, while the um, worship team gives us a moving number for this giving offering, before we do that, it let me offer up a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to give in this offering of missions. We thank you, Lord, that we might continue what you have asked us to do, Lord to be a help to those that are in need in order to serve you, Lord. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give and it will come back to you. I press down, shake it together, run it over. Give and it will come back to you. And it will come back to you. I press down, shake it together, run it over, dip, and it will come back to you. When you give to the Lord, give, and it will come back to you. I press down. Together, run it over, give, and it will come back to you when you give to the Lord. Amen. Amen. We welcome all of you to the Allen Temple African Methodist Episcopal worship experience this morning. Amen. 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 And to those that are watching online, from wherever you are tuning in from, we just want to welcome you and say thank you for being here with us today. And if this is your first time tuning in, won't you just put your name in the chat so that one of our virtual members and friends can properly welcome you. And again, we say thank you for joining in today. And here in the sanctuary, you guys look so beautiful this morning. Amen? Amen. If this is your first time walking through those, these doors of Allen Temple, Will you please stand so we might properly welcome you? Anybody? Okay, then. Alan Temple, let us stand to our feet. Let us come across the aisle. Let us put our arms around somebody. Let us tell them that we love them. And let us praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Amen. We'll now move on to our church announcements and ministry highlights. The Brooklyn Westchester District kick off with our journey through Lent. 2024 will be this Wednesday, February 14th, which is Ash Wednesday, and it will be a hybrid service and will take place at People's Institutional AME Church in Brooklyn. And if anybody's interested in going, please talk to me after the service. And for those that are online, and if you are interested in going but you're just not here in the sanctuary, please call the church office at 914-699-3934 and leave us a message. Amen? Amen. Um, we have a third quarterly conference with Alder Guyton on Tuesday, February 20th at 7.30 p.m. All leaders and component heads, please prepare for this meeting. It will be on Zoom. Our church school presents... African American history from emancipation through Jim Crow. And for anybody, yes, for anybody that has been in the last two sessions, workshops, they have been phenomenal. And this is the final and the third one, which is happening on Zoom February 23rd at 7 p.m. We have our TIPS telehealth intervention programs for seniors ages 55 and up. This is an opportunity, and we've done it two weeks in a row, and they have been very successful. Amen? Amen. You can get free screening to have your blood pressure checked, oxygen level checked, and weight checked every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. right here in the Allen Temple Fellowship Hall downstairs. So if you are interested, please show up this Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., and bring a friend with you. Amen? And there will be refreshments as well. So you don't want to miss on that. Okay. <laughs> we uh, have our weekly activities are in session. We will have the afterglow. This is conversations after the sermon, after what you have um, heard. We have an opportunity to just discuss it with the pastor. And it will take place immediately following the sermon. We have our tips. Free health screening, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., as I just mentioned. And we have the Women's Missionary Society doing their noonday prayer every Wednesday at noon, led by the Women's Missionary Society. And we have our deeply rooted Bible study, which will be canceled this Wednesday because of our Lenten service. But information will be sent out regarding the Lenten services that are going to be on Zoom, so you are welcome to join on those as well. Amen? Amen. And today, as part of our Black Honoring Black History Month, this morning, we honor our distinguished AME ancestor, Theophilus Gold Stewart. Theophilus Gold Stewart was an American author, educator, clergyman, and a U.S. Army chaplain and Buffalo soldier of the 25th U.S. Colored Infantry. Stewart was born on April 17, 1843 to James Stewart and Rebecca Gold in Galton Town, New Jersey. He was the son of free blacks and reared in a family that stressed education as he received his formal education in the Gold Town Public Schools. Stewart was ordained a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1863. And following the Civil War, Stewart helped organize the AME Church in South Carolina and Georgia. He was also active in reconstruction politics in Georgia. Stewart later moved from South Carolina to pastor the AME Church in Macon, Georgia, March 17, 1868. After the church was burned in a mysterious fire, he literally and figuratively built a new AME Church. The cornerstone was laid January 16, 1870, in the presence of 2,000 black Maganites, Maganites. After the war, he graduated from the Episcopal Divinity School of Philadelphia and later was awarded a Doctor of Divinity degree from Wilberforce University in Wilberforce, Ohio in 1881. From 1872, to 1891, Stewart established a church in Haiti and preached in the eastern United States. 
In 1891, he joined the 25th U.S. Colored Infantry, serving as its chaplain until 1907, and serving in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, and in the Philippines. He was a participant in the March 5th, 1897 meeting to celebrate the memory of Frederick Douglass, which founded the American Negro Academy, led by Alexander Hamel. From the founding of the organization until his death in 1924, Stewart remained active among the scholars, editors, and activists of this first major African-American learned society, refuting racist scholarship, promoting black claims to individual, social, and political equity, equality, and studying the history and sociology of African-American life. Between 1907 and his death on January 11th, 1924, Stewart was a professor of history, French, and logic at Wilberforce University. Today, today we honor our distinguished AME ancestor, Theophilus Galt Stewart. Ashe, and so it is. And now we prepare for our worship through giving, and our pro tem, Yvette Joseph, will is here to walk us through that process. Amen? Amen, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, Allen Temple. Good morning. Um, you all see me in my African attire? Because it's Black History Month. But I will continue to wear it right through the year because we're going to be honoring blacks for all year round. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because that's who we are. We are truly God's people and we have been blessed. Amen? So now I'm going to go into our tithes and offering and this is what I'm going to ask my worship team to do. We already sang that little song, Give and it will come back to you. Press down, shaken together and running over. So we're going to sing that song again and then I'm going to tell you a little testimony. Amen? Amen. Worship team? And I want you to pay attention to the words. Amen? Amen. Give, and it will come back to you. Press down, shake it together, run it over. Give, and it will come back to you. When you give to the Lord. One more time. Give. To you. How? I press down, shake it together, run it over, give, and it will come back to you when you give to the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. So I'm going to share something with you this morning. And the testimony is from someone who visits this church very often. But before we go into that, I want to read something to you. One of the reasons why we tithe is because we love God and because God loves us first. And he requires of us to do that. But I want you to listen to this. Generosity is an expression of love. God is the ultimate picture of generosity as he gives his very son for our salvation. This is found in John, the third chapter, verse 16. Giving doesn't earn you eternal life, but it is a powerful response to love, the love of God. Why give back to God? Because he gave to us. Amen? So when we ask you to give, it's not because we want you to pay the bills of the church. It is because God has asked us to do this. Now I'm going to share a little testimony with you. Most of you know that we past have been talking about work being done at the parsonage. The parsonage is a part of the church's building. It is a part of the sanctuary of God. We have a young man that is there that is doing some work there. And he has not asked for a dollar in payment. You guys are going to be seeing pictures soon of what the renovation looks like there. And I can tell you, it is nothing less than what God would ask us to do. Because he's doing it in perfection. And I had a conversation with him. And he said to me, 
all of what I'm doing doesn't make sense. It just doesn't add up because I'm losing money, but I feel like this is where I should be. I, I just can't understand because it doesn't make sense. Why am I giving all of this? But I know that this is where I should be. And whenever he comes, he gives. We are not giving him anything in terms of cash. But he knows that he's been blessed by God because of where he is and what God is doing through his life. So if God is doing something in your life and it does not add up, it does not make sense. You pay your bills and you wonder, how did I pay my bills? After tithing, one-tenth of my income. How did I pay my bills? It is because it does not make sense because God makes sense in your life. So when we ask you to give, it's not because, like I said, we want you to pay the bills of the church, but we are actually asking you to step up in faith and allow God to bless you. God is all love. It does not give you eternal life into heaven, but it sure does set a pace and a love for you and God, a connection, a, rela a relationship that you are building with God. And what better place to do that but in a house of God that you know that what you give is being used for the furtherance of his word. You know what we do in Guatemala. You know the two initiatives that we started that we give every first Sunday for missions offering. We are giving to St. Jude's, Jude's Children's Home is one of those initiatives. You see Pastor Rafi stand in this pulpit and talk about the work of Alan Temple. You've heard the testimonies that come out of that. You've seen how God has blessed us to bless them. Because it's not about us. It's not about Pastor Marriott. It's not about Sister Yvette. It's not about any one of us. But collectively, as God's people, we are being blessed. We don't know, and I'll share this with you, how we have been paying anything in this church. We don't know. And when we meet on board meetings, sometimes Sister Paula is like, it just don't add up. But we are still standing because God is doing something in this church. So if you want to be blessed like that, and if you say you love God the way you say you do, let us give because God is going to bless you. He's not going to show you with cash from heaven, but you're going to say, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up, but it works out because God is doing something wonderful in you. Amen? So I ask that as you prepare your tithes and your offerings, as you sit for a few minutes and you think about what God has done for you, how he has kept you, how he has provided for you, put your name on that envelope with pride. Put that money in through our giving apps online with pride, knowing that God is going to bless you. And when you do that, put a little something extra so we can finish the work at the parsonage. Because when it's done, it's a part of the house of God. You are going to be blessed, and God is going to bless you for your faithfulness. Amen? So I ask that you all put what, you, what God has blessed you with, and he has laid on your heart to give. Put it in something. If you don't have an envelope, you can still put it in, because God knows your heart, and he knows what you give. Amen? So I do ask that you all stand with your tithes and offering in hand. Face the center aisle. And, under the, the, and, and on the, the usher's oh, command, you're going to lead from the back of the church. Forward, give your tithes and your offering. When you do, give it with pride. And tap that basket and say, God, I love you. If you don't have to give, tap that basket and say, God, I love you. And watch God work it out for you and make sense. Amen? Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Say that one more time. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good.
Yes, he is good. Say, oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. For he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Everyone standing at this time as you are able to, as we give thanks to the Lord. Let us pray. Most gracious, heavenly, and eternal Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for these gifts which have now been brought into your storehouse. Father, we are thankful for the privilege to give. And Lord, we do not take it for granted. For Lord, we do know, Lord, that for many this is difficult. But it is in their obedience that they will recognize who you really are. So we thank you, Father, for the gift and for the giver. We pray, Lord, your blessings upon them that may that they may continue to be a blessing to their communities and to their families. And Lord, we will honor you as we turn this back over to you. Let us be good stewards over what you have placed in our hands and grant us the wisdom to do only that which brings glory to your name. For this and for all things, we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord. We've come now to the part of our worship experience where we pause from all the celebrating, all the singing, the dancing, the giving, the sharing, the caring, the loving, to recognize that now many of us, we are looking for something specific today from God. With every person here and every person who can hear me, you have needs. You have things going on in your lives where you want God to show up for you. You've blessed the church. You've blessed his people. You have blessed even strangers. But sometimes you yourself are in need of a blessing. Every person, I believe, who comes into the house of the Lord is looking for something from God. But I'm reminded how the scriptures tell us that we have not because we ask not. Now, don't want to take it out of context, but we all know that not everything you ask for you're going to get. But what we do know is that if you do not ask, it is highly likely that you will never get and so at this time as a ministry, while we recognize that everyone has needs, we also recognize that we as a church community cannot meet all of your needs, but we know who can. And so we open up the altar of the Lord at this time. And we invite you to come and to kneel and to pray, to talk to God for yourself, for what you might need from God, because the scriptures are clear, those who come to him must first believe that he is, that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So we create space in this church where the saints can diligently seek God on bended knees and with contrite spirits and hearts. And so whatever may be troubling you, whatever may be ailing you, 
whatever may be challenging you, the way has been prepared for you to enter into God's throne room of grace for yourself and speak to the master and the lover of our souls. God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he wants to hear from you. Now, for those that are online and watching and tuning in, we are so thankful and grateful that you are here. But God is omnipresent, meaning that he is everywhere at the same time. So while those here in the sanctuary have the privilege of kneeling at the altar, for those online, we offer you the opportunity to kneel in the altar and the sacred space of where you find yourself today. For whatever is set apart for God is God's and God's alone. And so if there is something heavy on your heart, whatever that may be, we invite you to come now and to kneel and to pray and to talk to God for yourself. Let him know the deep longings of your own soul. And at home you can kneel and pray for yourself and for those who you care about the most. But this is your moment and this is your time. And this is a sacred space for God is here. God is here. And so as our worship team leads us now in this soft selection, won't you come now as you feel so led in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a sweet anointing in this sanctuary there is a stillness in the atmosphere oh come lay down the burden to For in the sanctuary, God is here.
Oh, come, lay down the burdens in this sanctuary. Yes, Lord. For God is here. Eternal God, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are here. Eternal God, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord, for being here. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of prayer. And we thank you, Father, that we are able to come into your house one more time and to offer unto you our prayers, our supplications, our cares, our worries, and our burdens. Thank you, Father, for being the kind of God that hears the cry of your children. Now, Lord, respond to the needs of your people. Spirit of the living God in this sanctuary and even in the sanctuaries of the homes of those who are watching online. Spirit of the living God, meet every need in this house. Meet every person's heart's desire. For, Lord, you've said in your word that if we delight in you, you will give us the desires of our hearts. For as a deer pants for the water, so our souls long after you, O oh God. Lord, we are in many ways in despair. And Lord, sometimes our soul and our spirits are disturbed within us. But Lord, our hope is in you. And our hope is in your de redemptive work. And so therefore, Lord, we will remember you. We remember you, Lord, when we stood on the banks of the Red Sea and it needed to be parted so that those who were seeking after us would seek us no more. And so, Father, we lay down the burdens of our hearts upon you today. And Lord, in laying down our burdens, we lift before you Mother Beatrice Brown. Lord, as she is scheduled and prepared for the next step in her medical journey. We pray, oh God, that you will be with the doctors and the nurses. And that, Lord, you will quiet the anxiety in her heart and in the heart of her husband, Reverend Brown, Sr. 
and in the hearts of her family. Help them, Lord, to see, Lord, that if you brought her to it, you will take her through it. And so, Lord, we ask this favor, Lord, knowing, Father, that while at this stage in her life, fear, trepidation, worry, and anxiety can sometimes be our worst enemy. And so, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you replace all of that with hope, with joy, with love in the Holy Ghost. For, Lord, you have not given us a spirit of fear. So we, Lord, rebuke anything, Lord, that is not of you in this process. And may the procedure be one of great success. And may it reflect your fingerprint. For Lord, that hospital room will become a sanctuary where your presence will manifest. We lift before you, Lord, Sister Doreen's granddaughter, Kalani, who will also be undergoing her own procedure this week. Lord, you did say many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you deliver us through them all. So we pray for the skill of physicians and medical practitioners. For Lord, they are not operating on any, just anybody, but just one of your own. So Lord, we're not depending on the skill of the physicians. We're depending on the word of the great physician. And so, Lord, manifest your presence even in that procedure. For, Lord, we anticipate the rejoicing that comes when the morning comes. Spirit of the living God, we pray now for our own Aunt Bev and for the family. As, Lord, we as a community and as a body of believers prepare to lay Uncle Webster to rest. We are reminded, oh God, that he stood tall as a representative of the goodness of who you are. And so, Father, for all the forces that may be at work at this time, Spirit of the living God, we rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. And we say whatever the devil means for evil, God, you will turn around for the good. So, Lord, make this way straight. Make the crooked straight. And, Lord, bring him home in the oasis of your love, in the presence of all who would yet honor him. We pray on Bev's strength as she continues to offer you her worship. Continue to send your angels to encamp around her. Put a hedge of protection for heaven knows, Lord, the challenges don't always come from outside. Sometimes they come from within. So we cast the burden upon you now, Lord, and say, deliver Deliver now her from the snare of the enemy. We pray even today, Lord, for Sister Joy as she also, Lord, prepares her heart and her spirit as she loves on her father. We pray, oh God, that while we as the church will be a shoulder for her to lean on, she needs your cradling arms around her now during this difficult time. And so, Lord, we pray her strength, but we also pray that her faith fail her not. For, Lord, we know, Lord, that these are difficult times for many in our congregation and many around the world. But you are still God. No matter what a doctor may say, you are still God. No matter what troubles may come our way, you are still God. No matter how we may be feeling and how defeated we may be, you are still God. So, Lord, we need the still God today 
to be with those whose names we have called and for those whose names we have not even called. For all those who offered prayers to you at the altar of your grace, be the still God now and deliver them from all their cares and their worries. For God, you are here in the sanctuary. And so, Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayer and our hearts cry today. And we will continue to endeavor to be your people who are called by your name. Who will continue, O oh Lord, to humble ourselves and to pray and to seek your face and to turn away from all of our wicked ways. For we believe in faith that you will hear us you will forgive us and you will heal us. This we pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And the church said amen. 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 And amen. We thank God that we have come now to the preaching hour. And my prayer and my hope is that the word that has been prepared for your hearing will be a word that will transform, a word that will change lives. It is Black History Month, and we honor and celebrate all those who have made it possible that we can be here on a Sunday morning worshiping God without fear or trepidation. And so we invite you to open your hearts and open your minds and receive our phenomenal worship team as they prepare the ground for what thus saith the Lord. And after the singing of this selection, the next voice you hear will be that of the preacher. In Jesus' name, amen.
Here's my worship, all of my worship. Receive my worship, all of my worship. Oh, here it is. Here's my worship, all of my, all of my worship. Father, receive my, receive my worship. worship you for me for all the things you've done for me and no one can worship you for me oh say you Lord yes you My word. 
my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. Oh, say you have rescued. And you have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. rescued me. You have rescued I wouldn't be here today life. without you. And I'm never going back. So I know you know my response is my response is Oh, it's hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, what is he? You're my redeemer. So we will sing, we will sing. Hallelujah. So what's your rescued our lives and we're never going back so here's our worship all of our worship receive my worship You have rescued our lives. You have rescued our lives. And we're never going back. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes. Yes.
I love when a church worships in its purest form. Not out of orchestration or organization, but out of the spontaneous move of the Holy Spirit. You can't ask God to come in a place. And when, then God, and when God shows up, you're surprised. He has rescued our lives. And we are not going back. So I thank God for this spirit of worship that makes preaching easy. Amen? This past weekend, we celebrated our Founders Day, founding of the African Methodist Episcopal Church at our first district plaza in Philadelphia. And since this is also Black History Month, I thought I would use these next series of messages to provide some educational content regarding not just the African Methodist Episcopal Church, but also the black church within the context of American history. I will admit that these series of messages may become uncomfortable at times, and I, I want to kind of set the tone early, but if you hang in there, you will find that you are far better off knowing than not knowing some of the key things about our history, especially in the light of this dominant culture's push to try and rewrite American history. The book of Acts tells a story of the experience of the Apostle Paul. And I would like to read it again. And I want you to listen to the reading of these scriptures with ears that are sensitive to black folk. Listen to the scriptures as it's read, even though it's talking about the Apostle Paul and one of his many experiences. I want you to listen to it with the sensitivity of a person of color. Acts, the 22nd chapter, the 22nd through to the 29th verses, reads as follows. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. So while I will always exalt the name of Jesus, I want to take this opportunity to talk about why things are so difficult for people of color in this country to see if we can at least understand the underpinnings of the mindset of racism and, and why many white people believe that they are entitled to provisions that are not afforded to anyone that does not look like them. And I aim to do this in a message I've titled as a reflective question. By what right? By what right? right. Let us pray. 
Eternal God, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. By what right do we have to come into your house of worship to offer unto you anything at all? By what right are we as human beings who have fallen so far away from your glory, by what right can we come into your throne room of grace and even to make petition to you as a king? By what right? So Lord, speak through this preacher and let your people who listen here in the deepest parts of their souls why we have this right. Bless the word and the hearing, the preaching, the understanding, the receiving, and the accepting of this word today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <laughs> I am a naturalized citizen of the United States of America. I am a naturalized citizen because I was born outside of the United States in a beautiful country called Jamaica. And by virtue, that's right, and by virtue, and did I say it was beautiful? <laughs> Just want to make sure that that was clear. And by virtue of the immigration process, I was able to legally obtain American citizenship. Now, as a citizen of the United States, as validated, in fact, by the records that are kept with the Secretary of State of the United States of America, I have certain rights and privileges that would differentiate me from all others who do not possess such rights. Yeah. I have rights that people who come here as visitors do not have. I have rights that people who come here as diplomats do not have. I have rights that people who come here legally and then overstay do not have. I have rights that people who come here seeking amnesty do not have. I have rights that people who are refugees who come here do not have. I have rights that people who come here illegally do not have. I have rights that people who come here, or rather, who came here involuntarily, as in on slave ships, did not have. In fact, the rights that, I've, that have been afforded to me are no different from those who were born here, with the exception that I can never hold the office of president or vice president of the United States. Now, the Citizenship Clause of the United States Constitution's 14th Amendment says these words. Church, we need to learn some things. This is what the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution actually says in what's known as its Citizenship Clause. All persons born or naturalized in the United States, like me, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So on paper, I have some rights, some privileges, and some immunities as a citizen of these United States. Are you still tracking with me? Yeah. But it begs the question, what specifically are those rights or privileges 
or immunities that come with citizenship, such that no state can make any rule to append them. Well, these rights and privileges are actually found in what, and you guessed it, what's known as the Bill of Rights. And they include, hear this, freedom of speech, so I can say what I want. Freedom of religion, so I can worship who or where I want. The right to keep and bear arms. Hello. The freedom of assembly. And the freedom to petition, meaning I can go protest. It also prohibits unreasonable search and seizure. Cruel and unusual punishment and compel self-incrimination. So as a citizen of the United States of America, I have all of these privileges and immunities, and according to the United States Constitution, no state, including all the southern states, Alabama, Georgia, you name it, all the southern states can make any rule or any law that can take these rights and privileges and immunities away from me. Furthermore, the part that I especially want to highlight in the Bill of Rights is the part where it prohibits or prevents or stops states from carrying out unreasonable searches and seizures, unreasonable cruel and unusual punishment, and unreasonably compelling self-incrimination. So to make it very plain, as a citizen of the United States of America, whether born here or naturalized, no state can search or seize my property. No state can inflict cruel and unusual punishment on me. And no state can compel me to incriminate myself. Unless it's reasonable. That's what it said in the text unless it's reasonable. Hmm. But what history has shown us, especially as black people, is that states, in fact, thought it reasonable to seize <laughs> and search my property, as in the case of something called imminent domain. <laughs> states, in fact, thought it reasonable to inflict cruel and unusual punishment on us, as in the case of chattel slavery. States that, in fact, thought it was reasonable to compel us to incriminate ourselves, as in the case of the so-called Central Park Five. And, and since states, in fact, did these things because we are black, then it stands to reason that we might not really be seen as citizens after all. <laughs> Whether we were born here, dragged here, or not. Hmm. In fact, this truth is reasonably, this truth I'm talking about is reasonably codified, which means to put into words and in a book and in a document, is reasonably codified in the United States Constitution in Article 1, Section 2, and Clause 3, more popularly known as the Three Fifths Compromise. You know it, where the government counted three-fifths of all of the slaves in a state toward that state's total population for the purpose of giving southern states more power in the House of Representatives. This allowed, of course, states to reasonably carry out searches and seizures, reasonably <laughs> cause cruel and unusual punishment, and reasonably compel us to self-incriminate. Did you whistle at that white woman? Well, I did not. Yes, you did. I did not. Yes, you did. And I will beat you till you say you did. Compelling self-incrimination. For that was, at the time, reasonable. Are you with me? It, 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 was this un, it was this reasonable codification that permitted states to enact disenfranchisement laws known as Jim Crow, <laughs> which was, by the way, a formal and legal system of racial apartheid. 
that dominated the American South for three quarters of a century beginning in the 1890s. These laws affected almost every aspect of black daily life, mandating segregation in schools, parks, libraries, drinking fountains, restrooms, buses, trains, and restaurants with white only and colored only signs as constant reminders of the enforced racial order. Brothers and sisters, this was legal. In legal theory, blacks received separate but equal treatment under the law, yeah. where in actuality, public facilities for blacks were nearly always inferior to those for whites if they even existed at all. I'm only telling you the truth. It's history. In addition, blacks were systematically denied the right to vote in most <laughs> of the rural South through the selective application of literacy tests and other racially motivated criteria. You can only vote if you guess how many jelly beans are in this jar. Now while Section 2 of the 14th Amendment in 1868 later superseded this clause and explicitly repealed the compromise, does not change the fact that while you can easily change and amend a document, while you can easily create a new law to overshadow the old law, while you can add amendments and addendums, the truth of the matter is, it's not so easy to change a mindset. And when that mindset believes that you are only three-fifths of a person, they don't care what's on the paper or what is legal for I will always see you as less than, not quite a citizen. You're not fully human as far as we're concerned, and I can trade you like cattle. I'm just saying. So with that kind of mindset, the question we all must ask is simply this, which is the title of my sermon, By What Right? What gives you the right to do what you're doing? Where does that come from? By what right were they allowed to kidnap people from another country and separate families? What gave you the right? By what right are you allowed to transport human beings in dehumanizing conditions across the Middle Passage? What gave you that right? By, by what right? What, what gives you the right to, you know, what gave them the right to, to enslave human beings? And by what right are you allowed to profit from another's free labor. Furthermore, and to make it even relevant in our day, because I like to make things relevant, by what right are they incarcerating blacks in state prison at nearly five times the rate of white Americans? By what right are they sentencing our youth to juvenile correctional facilities and then later arresting and convicting them as adults, forcing them to serve time in adult jails at a significantly higher rate than their white counterparts? Are you tracking with me? By what right are they changing sentencing laws and policy such that there are two million people in the nation's prisons and jails, which is a 500% increase over the last 40 years when there is no such commensurable change in the crime rate. You see, if the crime rate was changing to the point where more blacks are doing things, then it would make sense. But the crime rate is the crime rate. I'm just saying. By what right are they giving black youth prison sentences that were on average 7.8% longer than the prison sentences they give to whites for the same type of offense? Now, all of this you can find out for yourself because I'm not making these up. And I want to thank Dr. Charles Boyer during our Founders Day for presenting us with this information. And you can look him up. And if that were not enough, by what right are they denying us mortgages? <laughs> by what right are they giving us higher interest rates even though we have the same credit score as other folk? <laughs> by what right 
are they delaying small business loans to black farmers, thereby causing them to not be prepared for their annual crop seasons? You see the subtlety, right? <laughs> By what right? And I'm just asking the question because I need somebody, anybody, to tell me why. Now, to answer these questions, we have to go back a little bit in history to see just where they believe they have earned this right. And to be clear, to be clear, the they that I'm talking about <laughs> is the dominant culture, which is white people. And the reason why I'm being so emphatic is because it is high time that we as a church stop dancing around politically correct terms and call a thing for what it actually is. The problems of our community stem from the leadership of institutions that are run by people other than black people. And these institutions are overwhelmingly dominated by white people. This is not to suggest, of course, that all white people are bad or even to suggest that all black people are good. But it is to make clear that to solve the problems of our community, we have to go to the source yes, of where the problem exists well. and from whom the cause of the problems emanate. If a slave master was the source of our problem, we had to go to the institution of slavery and the government and the slave master in these United States because the slave master was not black. Hmm. In some cases. If the police are killing our people, then we have to go to the office of the mayor and the police departments and to their police unions as well. If doctors are killing our women, then we have to go to the medical schools and to their medical associations. And finally, if our kids are not being educated, then we have to go to the school boards and the superintendents and the teachers. I think you get my point. And here's my favorite, to be honest with you. If we got a problem with the justice system, you kind of got to sign up for jury duty too and get on those boards. I'm just saying. So this is not about making enemies or being scared to be canceled. I don't care. This is about going to the source of our issues and not being afraid to confront it. Because according to the Constitution of the United States, we, we have a right to do so. <laughs> but, by why, but by what right are they doing all the things that they've been engaged in? That was the question I asked. Well... 89 years after the Declaration of Independence had proclaimed that all men to be, were free and equal, slavery was supported under the original Constitution since it clearly affirmed that African Americans were worth only three-fifths of a person. Remember, the Constitution made that clear. But the more insidious Justification came through, you guessed it, the Supreme Court. You see, where even though many Americans were opposed to racism, there were a lot of people, we call them abolitionists back then, who really didn't feel comfortable because some of them were godly, God-fearing people. And, and we understand that they were a little uncomfortable about that. They unwittingly, in many cases, agreed with Chief Justice Roger Taney. Look him up, his claim in what we know to be the Dred Scott decision in 1857, he said that the Founders' Constitution regarded blacks, and I quote, as so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. That's what a Supreme Court justice said. And oh, by the way, when you see uh, 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 Ron DeSantis say, slavery was good for black people, why? Because they learned certain skills. You have to hear 
what he's saying behind the words. Because if you think that we gain skills because of oppression, you really don't know who we are. This is a singular statement that I believe that made white people feel that they had a right to do all the things that we, by intuition alone, know to be unjust. This is what gave them the right. So now you know. With this in mind, and make no mistake about it, you might not have, you, you might have even been born here. You might have been naturalized here. But the evidence shows that it was, and still in many ways, is seen by the dominant culture that it is still today reasonable to seize and to search your property. To inflict cruel and unusual punishment on you today. Stop and frisk. To compel you to incriminate yourself, to incarcerate your children at an alarming rate, to emasculate black men, to over-sexualize black women, to disenfranchise, undervalue, and marginalize you because these injustices were protected by law. That's what they do. That's what they did by right. So how is it that all of this is related to our text today? Well... Let's revisit it. Now, as I read our text, I, I ask you to imagine the Apostle Paul as if he were representing the consciousness of African Americans, facing the dominant Roman culture, which is emblematic of the mood and the mindset of white America. And I, and I want to read it again. After everything that I've just said, I want to read it one more time because, again, it, you, know, you, you, know, you know, learning happens through repetition. Right? So, so, so repetition, they say, is the mother of learning. So again, listen to the text. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? <laughs> yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The apostle Paul, as he was facing the masses whip, inquired, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? In other words, Paul is simply asking, by what right? That's what he was doing, right? By what right? By what right are you taking it upon yourself to inflict pain on a people who have done nothing to harm or hinder your success or your ability to survive, other than to try and survive themselves in a society of oppression and degradation, even to the point where they do, when they do try to pull themselves up by their laceless bootstraps, you burn and lynch and maim them. But what fascinates me in the story is how the dominant culture responded. Look carefully again. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am. He answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul said. Here we have Paul, a natural-born citizen, asserting his right to not be dehumanized through a public beating by a naturalized citizen. 
who was not born in Rome, but instead was an immigrant who happened to have had the resources to buy his citizenship. Do you see the hypocrisy? Someone who assumed the identity of a nation. Persecuting someone because he did not know who he was persecuting. Sounds familiar? If not, it should. You see, in a nation that was founded by immigrants and refugees fleeing religious persecution, who had stolen the lands from an indigenous people, taking others away from their own homeland to be enslaved for economic gain and to even engage in a brutal civil war to protect their right to dominate are now the same people that were persecuting people who are natural born citizens. This is precisely why Frederick Douglass on July 5th, 1852, in his famous keynote address at an Independence Day celebration, asked the question, are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? This 4th of July of yours, is, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. <laughs> for the public grieving, as Frederick Douglass implied, by African Americans all these years since 1619 is, as, is, is understood in the words of Walter Brueggemann who says this, the most visceral announcement that things are not right is in our grieving. Only the empire, the dominant culture, only in the empire are we pressed and urged and invited to pretend that things are all right. And as long as the empire, the dominant culture, can keep the pretense alive that things are all right, there will be no real grieving, and get this, no real serious criticisms. This is why white people keep telling black people to just get over it. Slavery happened a long time ago. But the wound is still raw, for it has never been dressed. And even before the statements of Frederick Douglass, Richard Allen, founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, upon whose shoulders we now stand even today, Richard Allen thought heavily about the idea of even leaving this nation and going to places like Canada. He himself stated in 1830, this is what he said, his words, the formation of a settlement in the British province of Upper Canada would be a great advantage to people of color, where we shall be entitled to all the rights, privileges, and immunities as other citizens. AME Bishop Richard Allen doubted the ability of the United States to foster an environment of racial equality. And so for the last 15 years of his life, he meditated deeply on black exodus from this country rather than black redemption within this country. In fact, Allen publicly testified to his divided soul for he was an American and not an American. He was a free man and not a free man. A man dedicated to saving America from racial sin <laughs> and a man in search of a country free from racial sin. He was an African American and an African trapped in America. And the most troubling question we as people of color must soberly ask ourselves, especially as we reflect honestly during this Black History Month, is this question which popped into my spirit as I'm working on this sermon. Here is the question that I want, if you hear nothing else in this message, listen to this question. Because I think unless we reflect on it, change ain't gonna come. So here is the question for everyone, whether here in the sanctuary or even those watching online. Is America just about us improving the welfare of white men? 
Think about what I just asked. Is America just about us improving the welfare and the livelihood of white men? Think about where you work. Think about how you live. Think about how you make ends meet. Think about the opportunities that you have or have been denied. Think about who benefits ultimately from everything that you put your hands to, where even your children are operating in a manner that causes someone else to benefit. I'm just asking the question as a lowly preacher. That's the real question about where we are in this country. And I'll, I'm okay with asking the hard questions. Because if the answer to the question is yes, then those that are leading our institutions and those that are in power have every right to inflict on us the injustices that we have come to experience. If that's why we're here, they have every right to do it. But if the answer is no, is going to come a reckoning one day. For those that have spent centuries persecuting the innocent and profiting off of the backs and lives of the marginalized and exploiting the vulnerable, huh, they will have to answer one day for their atrocities. For the Bible tells me that God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he shall also reap. For the dominant culture has no right to do the things that they're doing and have done. But the Apostle Paul, in his challenge to the dominant culture, in the text, it tells us those who were about to interrogate him withdraw immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized <laughs> that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. This lets me know that there is still such a thing as grace for America. For if America recognizes that some of us, especially black people, are citizens protected by the rights as established in the Bill of Rights, then she has to withdraw her offense immediately and repent. This is the prophetic call upon this nation. And for those who are on the fringes, who are seeking citizenship, the question has to be asked, what right do they have to deny you the opportunity to express your freedom? So they use it as a weapon for those who are on the border. Because those who are escaping their own persecution have found the worst enemy they could find from a people who should know what it's like to be escaping themselves. <laughs> I have to opine a little bit on even what's happening in Gaza. People have been pushed to the edge, to the southern Gaza, and everything that they knew before has been decimated. And now leaflets are falling saying, hey, find somewhere else to go. And Egypt says, you can't come across this border. So you have in an area that used to be occupied by maybe several thousands, peop thousands of people, a small area now being occupied by over two million people. It's like Mount Vernon is four square miles and you take every single black person in America and you push them in these four square miles and all the border. You can't go to the Bronx. You can't go, you can't go to the Bronx. You can't go to, to, to Pelham. You can't go to Yonkers. You can't go to Eastchester. You're packed in this area and they're saying, okay, find somewhere to go because now we're getting ready to bomb this area. My brothers and my sisters, I could care less what criticisms you give me from this pulpit. But there is a part of me that wants to try to understand why a people who know what it's like to be persecuted persecutes themselves. I want to understand the mindset because you can write something on paper, but until the mindset has been changed, until I see you as a human being, I will always treat you 
as three-fifths or even less than. If I see you as an animal, you have no rights. And I ain't talking about Jewish or Palestinian relations. I'm talking about human beings and how we treat each other. Yes, you can. I have a responsibility to respond and defend myself because the Bill of Rights did tell me I could take up arms, did it not? To defend myself. Didn't say take up arms to go on the offensive. Very different. But anyway, so as I close this reflective American history message during this Black History Month, I want to say that Paul stayed persecution from his adversary because he knew his rights as a citizen. Certainly as a citizen of Rome, but more importantly, as a citizen of heaven. For as Paul himself says in Philippians, the third chapter and the 18th to the 21st verse, and, and this is the part where I got excited. Paul says, hear this church, for as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with Years. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. How about you? Do you know where you belong and where you really are a citizen. And I'm not talking about the United States or Haiti or Jamaica. For if not, you have an opportunity today to migrate to a land that flows with milk and honey, where your citizenship was bought and fully paid for, thereby giving you the right to be called a child of God. Yes, sir. And if you want all of the rights and privileges and immunities that come with that kind of citizenship, then I invite you to join me today for you must be born again. See that? Did y'all catch that? You must be born born of incorruptible seed. Paul says, I was born a citizen. And you and I must be born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. For what is born of the Spirit is of the Spirit. And what is born of the flesh is of the flesh. And so the question is asked, by what right do we have to call God Father? Jesus paid the price. And it is by his right that you and I are free. Finally, free. May the Lord richly bless you, my beloved. This is my Father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world 
skies and seas his hand the wonders wrong can you sing that again for me eve this is my father's world this is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world i rest me in the thought of rocks and trees and skies and seas his hand the wonders roar thank you this is my father's world. Now you can't call God your father if you don't have his DNA. And the way to get his DNA is you must be born again. You must be born again. I love the African Methodist Episcopal Church for a lot of reasons. And for those of you who may not be familiar with all of his history, we'll get into that in another day at another time. But we were born out of, this church was born out of protest. You know, when the greater Methodist faith thought black people who worshipped God, the same God that they worshipped, needed to sit and be in the back. When we came to kneel at the altar to pray like I call you all to do on Sundays, you know, there was an overzealous sexton who said, you can't pray here and pull us, pull Richard Allen and others, Absalom Jones and others all of the, off his feet. Pull him up. So you can't pray here. And Richard Allen in a moment had the presence of mind to say, allow me to finish my prayer. After which we will trouble you no more. And Richard Allen and all the black folks walked out of St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia in that moment and decided to worship God under their own vine and fig tree. You're part of a history, for those of you who are members of this church. You're part of a rich history in not just protest, but in a faith that God can take people who have absolutely nothing and to show them great and wondrous things. I love the logo of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You can see it on my, on my, on my stoli, which you see the anvil and you see the cross. And what many people don't know, the cross is actually not behind the anvil. The cross is through the anvil, right? Hardship, a religion and a faith that was birthed with blood, sweat, and tears. I love that history. But there is a cross that is far more important than the cross of Alan. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us, we have challenges and we have needs and we have worries and we have cares and we have concerns. But we have to be honest with the fact that we are dealing with something that is far more sinister, far more insidious and far more destructive to our very souls, and that is the dominant culture's spirit, the zeitgeist that wants to see us destroyed. But I believe with all of my heart, and I say it every Black Sunday, I really believe this, church, that the only reason why this nation is still a nation is because of the spirit of the African American that still believes in the words of the amended Constitution. We still believe that there's an opportunity for this nation to live up to the ideals that are put on paper. We still believe that. And the truth of the matter is, while there may be those that love to talk about it, there are those of us who actually try to live it. Let the playing field be level. 
You know? Don't, don't tip the scales. Give us exactly what everybody else is getting. Let us handle our own. We, we, we don't need a lot. Because I guarantee you, just give us a few years. And watch. And watch. That's the spirit of the African American. And guess what? We still pray for this nation. So God sees a remnant of a people that are still, and he's going, I still see y'all. So while you still pray for this nation, they're, they're covered. The dominant culture doesn't know that we are their covering. And I believe that with all of my heart, I will start worrying about this nation when the black church stops praying for it. That's what I believe. So I stand here as a naturalized citizen. I love this country. I love it. But I love Jamaica too. And I love Haiti too. And I love Trinidad and Tobago. And I love Ghana. And I love Sweden. And I love Norway. But not at the expense of the kingdom of God. Because all of it is my father's world. His wonders to perform of rocks and trees and of all of the seas and everything that there is. This is my father's world. And he ain't going to let nobody turn it upside down. So that was my little black history speech. <laughs> but I love the kingdom of God. And I love you as well. And I want to see none of you perish. So if today has been a moment of reflection and reckoning, where you, you heard some things that stirred your spirit, and you know, you say to yourself, it's time. I invite you all to stand. And there may be someone here today that this is the moment where I believe God is calling me to something higher. If you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart for yourself, if you've never made that declaration of faith, you thought you might have and you think you did and you know your parents and your grandparents, everybody used to be in church and go to church, but you never ever for yourself actually walked and made the confession of faith. And this is your moment and this is your time. I'm not telling you to join the church yet, but I am inviting you into the kingdom of God. And the call is for those that are online as well too. You're just as much under the sound of my voice. So if there's one person here today that wants to find the Lord in their soul and in their spirit, come. Just walk. Don't even let anything bother you. Don't let anybody, don't let any pressure, just walk. Just come, that we may receive you. Is there one? Is there one? It is my Father's world. I rest me in the thoughts of rocks and trees and skies and seas. next call is for someone who knows the Lord. You've been walking with the Lord for however long, but you're looking for a place to call your very own, a place where the Word of God is preached without apology or hesitation, where the only thing we tell you to do is just believe. Just believe. If you're looking for that kind of church, I would love to lock arms with you and walk with you and to learn together as we travel this journey of faith together. If you're looking for that kind of church where, you know, you want to be planted Deeply rooted, deeply rooted in the soil of the kingdom. 
then we invite you to consider making Allen Temple African Methodist Episcopal Church your church home. For those online, the question is for you as well. If you want to make this your church home, say, I'm with Alan. Write that in the chat. I'm with Alan. And that'll let us know that you're part of, we can count you in our number. And if salvation is what you did, I want you to write, I'm free, in the chat. If salvation is what you got. But we want you all to know that we are here for you. And we mean it. We don't have everything that we want, but we have everything that we need. And together, we're going to try to figure this thing out. I don't know everything. In fact, I don't know anything except Christ and him crucified. And together, we can figure it all out. Is there one? Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Father, for those who have heard this word and heard this message. An unusual message, yes. But something about history allows us, Lord, to use it as a springboard into your history, into our next. So we thank you, Father, for the spirit of the African American. We thank you, Lord, that even in the bowels of a slave ship, he and she, never gave up. Still knowing that one day they would see all their loved ones from whom they've been separated again. Thank you that our heart still beats with a faith and a belief that how this nation was intended to be is still possible if some can find the need to repent. So Lord, let it begin with us by how we live and how we treat each other. And Lord, if you give us the opportunity, we will speak truth to power in love, and we will do all that you have asked. But help us, Lord, to not play the role of hypocrites. Help us to call a thing a thing. And Lord, we don't know any other way about how to be anything other than who we are. But before we are black, before we are white, before we are Korean, before we are Japanese, before we are whatever, we are yours. So we thank you for this time and this moment. Thank you, for it is by your right that we've been made free. In Jesus' name, amen. This is... As you prepare to leave this place, but never from God's presence, let us sing our closing doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore and the church all over the world we say in unison
Amen. Go in peace and take the peace of God with you. Say.